Hey, beautiful souls and creative minds. Welcome to The Artist Stoop, the podcast where we turn the art world into your personal playground. I'm Jillian Zapata, your host, and I can't wait to dive into the art world with you. Each episode, we'll be kicking it with an incredible artist, unraveling their stories and turning the spotlight on the magic that happens beyond the brush. Get ready to discover new perspectives, forge connections, and immerse yourself one captivating conversation at a time. So grab your favorite beverage, maybe a sketchbook, and let's jump into the kaleidoscope of creativity together. This is The Artist Stoop, where art isn't just a thing you see, it's an experience you feel. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Artist Stoop. Today, we have the pleasure of diving into the colorful world of Rebecca Jack, an intuitive painter whose vibrant works celebrate the beauty of imperfection. Through expressive brushwork, visible layering, and a keen exploration of color and shape, Rebecca's figurative pieces offer a glimpse into a whimsical yet deeply reflective realms. With a background in interior design and a soulful approach to her craft, Rebecca brings to life the essence of humanity in her paintings, earning her the title of a soul painter. Join us as we unravel the artistic journey of this Knoxville native and now based in Atlanta who finds inspiration in the intricate dance between interior and exterior spaces, all while balancing her love for dogs, a good cup of coffee, and the joys of family life. So welcome Rebecca Jack to the podcast. Thanks, Jillian. I appreciate you having me on. I'm excited to have this chat. Yeah, me too. Um, like, I usually start the episode out like explaining to the audience how I know my fellow guests, but you are like, you know, before we jumped in, I said, you are the first person that I actually do not know. I would, you were the first person that, you know, I was scrolling through Instagram and I just truly loved your work and was drawn to it. And I was like, I want to talk to her. So you are my first person that I do not know at all. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm excited well, because that's awesome. I'm excited to get to know you and um, also for our audience to get to know you because you do have this very colorful work. And the best way I can describe your work, obviously, it's very you, but I'm going to say it to me, it looks it pulls a little Picasso, a little Matisse and a little Henri Rousseau elements all kind of blended into one and it's it's very very unique and i just thank you it's i would also add fernand legere i don't know if yes he's an artist <laughs> love him yeah so do you draw inspiration for some of those artists or i do i mean i have i have a whole bunch of books i'm just looking at some now like de kooning philip gustin um i've got a lot of abstract like there was an artist stanley uh, Whitney that I really love, mm -hmm. Le Corbusier, Mark Rothko. I mean, there's so many. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so many. To, but a lot of abstract, um, ironically, abstract paintings, um, I can see like elements and shapes of figures in them, and especially the ones that are more shape oriented. Yeah. And those can inspire me a lot for my figurative work. It's amazing because I also, and I think the other reason why I'm really drawn to your work is because I love drawing figures. Like my, like, obviously my stuff is very, very abstract and now it still has like subtle lines of bodies, but it's just like my early, early work. I did the whole abstract, like the body, like ever since high school, I was always focused on the body and the figure. And I think, like I said, that is one of the reasons why I'm really drawn to your work because you do it so beautifully. And you also add that element of interior spaces. Like it's like a still life, but it's not a still life with the body thrown in. And it's just a lot of fun. Yeah. I think like from where I'm at now, it's just this culmination of everything that it's like the kitchen sink. I've just piled it, everything that I've done in the past from interior design career to uh, drawing figurative life drawing classes to my abstract work to floral or still lifes so it's just like all hodgepodge together yeah how <laughs> so you were an interior designer for a while how wow. how how long's a while <laughs> i started my career in 2020 and i stopped in 2022 okay 
there was a little bit of time like taken off for I haven't had my son and um I think like in 2008 there was like a year or so or less for when I was um, out of work for the recession but um yeah like about 20 years yeah does um does and being an interior designer, does that influence your work at all? And like how you see paintings or like, do you, do you, does it help you like maybe visualize how it would like look in a room when you're painting or do you just paint? Um, I mean, I'm definitely just painting when I'm painting. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't have a plan when I start out and it really just is this intuitive organic evolution and there's uh, no sketches or anything prior. I'm really just putting color and shapes and forms down and allowing the painting to reveal itself to me. And so that's what makes painting exciting every day when I come in the studio because it's this dance that we're doing and that I'm giving information and it's giving information back to me. And, um, and sometimes they can be stubborn. <laughs> Oh, I don't want to go the way I want it to go. So I've I've learned to kind of relax into this intuitive space. However, I am I love interior design. I love looking at interior design spaces or thinking about um, how I want to design my own home or just the colors um, that designers use. These unique combinations or patterns or textures and layers like that all connects to my work in some way too. Like I'm, I'm very much thinking about layering and thinking about colors and thinking about adding certain patterns into the into the work. And then the other thing that can, kind of connects to the interior design component is I, I think I also think very spatially into my paintings, like creating some, even though some of the, the figures can be very flat, there's also some depth added in or thinking about like them being in particular spaces. And that kind of, like I said, just comes organically. I don't have a specific space that I'm trying to emulate. It's just kind of where they want to be at the, that moment in time. <laughs> I mean, that's... <laughs> it's really hard to be a really solid intuitive painter like that. Like that comes with a lot of practice and skill and yeah. So it's, that's awesome. And you are not the only one who talks to their paintings and they get stubborn and you're like, Hey, I need you to tell me where to go next. It <laughs> it's, it is, it's a total dance when you do start to paint. Um, how did you get this title of a soul painter? Like, I was really intrigued by that in your bio. Gosh, well, I think like, um, what, so these painting, the, the figures that show up in my work or the portraits that I'm working on are not necessarily a particular person um, that I'm trying to emulate. Like they really are an essence of something. And so I think, um, like we all are these energetic living beings. We have some like magic secret sauce that's that makes us human, right? And so I'm trying to pull out that essence that I see in other people or that I experience uh, just, yeah, throughout. So like having this, um, like being able to pull out the essence and make these figures feel like they have an aliveness inside. Yeah. That's, I mean, it's self-titled that I'm a soul painter, but that's what I'm trying to get at when I say I love I'm a soul that. painter. I love that because that's, that's how people connect to your paintings, you know, like when you can translate that onto a canvas, that mood, that energy, that feeling and which you do, um, you know, and you do that with your color, your texture, whatever. And when someone looks at it and then they can get that back, that's, that's when you're just like, yes, I, I succeeded. Yeah. And I also think of them as a, somebody who can be a mirror and a reflection to what's going on in the person that's viewing it. So I want that kind of feedback and connection between the viewer and um, what's in the painting. 
Yeah. I was recently, I just did this workshop and one of the lessons that they were talking about was, you know, what can the painting do for the person? How does it help them? You know, and that's exactly what you're, you're hitting on the head there is that, you know, how it being able to help them wherever they're at in that phase of their, their life. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. special. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so you're, Beautiful figurative abstracts, um, and you state that your figures are bold yet vulnerable. Can you dive into that bold yet vulnerable for us? Sure. Um, well, so my my figures are very much larger than life on the canvas, or like real life size uh, figures. Um, so they're very much they take up a lot of space on the canvas. And they're unavoidably con confronting you on the picture plane. So begging you to communicate and connect with them. And they have a lot to say, but it's, um, yeah, it's more just this softness in their expression. And this, it, it's not an aggressive confrontation so there's this dichotomy between like here i am have a conversation with me but yet tell me about yourself or like let's let's be a little bit more reflective and communicate in a in a softer way i don't know how to i'm describing that well but it, it's just like a a, a less um yeah it's just not very as aggressive as like big and bold might feel or maybe yeah. aggressive, not the word, but like in your face, you, you can't, you can't um, ignore me, but yet there is a softness yeah, that, that's waiting to be like a door that is waiting to be open and explored there. Yeah. I, um, I also think that is portrayed in the poses at the, that they're in, you know, they're, they are in a very welcoming, welcoming, opening as a grave. Yeah. They're in these very welcoming poses. It's just like, Hey, I'm relaxed. Come be relaxed with me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you talk about color and shape a lot. So when you're, when you're painting, do you plan your color palette to help like bring these stories or these emotions that you're trying to, describe in these beings does that um do you pre-plan your colors or is that more an intuitive approach as well as well what do you think julian probably intuitive you were to guess. <laughs> at this point at this point i wouldn't say intuitive <laughs> ding 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 yes that's right i just grab and go and kind of adjust as you need yeah but like you know it's interesting um i think there are also colors that maybe i might gravitate to as I've been out in the world or looking through, scrolling through Instagram or looking through magazines. So I think there's definitely an outside influence that subconsciously comes out, uh -huh. but it's not like I, I don't plan anything. Yeah. Um, I was on a walk the other day with my dog and so color inspiration, I guess, can come from like random places. I, I saw like in the distance on our walk, there was this beautiful lime green dumpster con uh, composed like next to like this red curb that was uh, rubbed off. Like the paint had kind of rubbed off. So it was this real light, pretty pink. And like, I just loved, and then there was a couple of like other colors, like some gray and like a, a yellow yeah. or whatever. And there was just some beautiful, it was just a beautiful color palette yeah. right there I was like snapping pictures like so I would remember but it also getting back to like color and emotion it also connects what I love about color is that not only if you get the color combinations right they can vibrate and like mm -hmm. you know create an energy with it but um, they also connect to our memory and um, certain emotions and and things like that and so what those two colors the pink and the green reminded me of was when I was younger we had in the 80s we had these barrettes that we would weave ribbons through and like decorate them I don't know if you did that or not but um 
uh, and mine were like, I had these pink and green, like those same colors. And it was just brought me back to that memory of that age and what I was like at that time. And so just kind of interesting how things kind of take you down a, a rabbit hole or a tangent. Yeah. And just by seeing color. Yeah. And then by having those colors, that energy and that mood, that memory probably then got translated on to the, the canvas for you in a way. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Is it okay? So I have colors that I love. They're like my favorite colors. I love a good purple and I love like a moss green, but and like different shades of green. But I have the hardest time painting with both of those colors. Like when it goes on the canvas, it's just like an eyesore to me for some reason. Like I can't make mm -hmm. them look as beautiful as I want or bring them in. Is there colors that you know that sometimes just don't jive with you that you stay away from is there colors that you gravitate more towards like that are always end up in your paintings I think I go through phase color phases I, I definitely am not afraid of color and I seek out unusual color combinations um almost like to see kind of go against the grain like to see if something if I could make something work that maybe might not Normally, yeah. Normally work. So like for a while there, I was doing a lot of blues and greens. And so I started to get a little foam like that was a little bit stagnant. So I started uh, veering towards more warmer colors, reds and yellows and oranges. And it just gave me a new challenge because as I was working with maybe the cooler palette, blues and greens, I started um, just feeling that it was not as exciting to me so just by changing up the color palette i i became had new challenges and started to become excited and, about the color and when when i get excited i think like that really shows up in the work in the painting too yeah absolutely um so your work incorporates interior spaces and when you pull those in is that part of a theme or the feeling of a painting like those still lifes that you bring in those interiors well i i think i see the i see the interior spaces and the still life components kind of like a more of symbolism symbolic elements in the painting to kind of connect with the interior spaces that are um yeah this in internal dialogue that someone has so you have um you have your physical body but you also have a mental and emotional body and these are like these energetic spaces where your thoughts and feelings and emotions and things kind of get stored or live and so it's it's kind of pulling and identifying those different elements my mind is like <laughs> that is amazing that's very um a unique approach to be able to have you know you have the physical being and then that emotional being in there and that now i'm going to go look at your work and see something completely different now knowing knowing that can you maybe describe one of the paintings like that you've recently done or um and maybe pull in like one of those emotions or feelings that you described uh well i, I don't i'm not going to remember the name of it right off the bat well maybe it's called tully and um she's holding a well i've got a couple where they're like holding a, a vase one's holding a vase of flowers one's just holding like this big like vase urn thing and to me that symbolized like of or holding a vessel so like if you think of like, any kind of container it, it's holding something so what are they holding is it um you know, depending on the the expression, maybe she's holding some sadness, maybe she's optimistic and looking at the future of of what she wants to happen in her life or his life, I guess, if it's a male. Um, and so so the it doesn't necessarily have to represent like something specific, but it could be comp specific to somebody who's viewing it. So the container is a good example. Um, if you have a bowl of fruit that's representing a lot of um, bounty or like fullness in in life, where 
plants can symbolize new growth. Like I had this one painting I did um, last year around this time. It was for a it was created a special collection for the High Hampton in Cashiers, North Carolina. And one of my favorite paintings in that collection was this woman and she had um, vines kind of growing up. It was like right at this juncture of time where you're coming out of winter and you're seeing the the first elements of spring. And so some of the car the colors in the painting was was darker like kind of that still wintry mood but then you had this lightness um in certain elements and then the the growth of the coming up from the ground so like that was something that was symbolic um in in that time period i love that that's that's amazing one well, i'll definitely have to get that image so we can put them in the show notes so people can see yeah. what we're we're talking yeah. about um so you just mentioned something. So do you typically work in collections or do you do one-offs? Like, you know, you said you had, you know, the pieces that all had the different vases or you had the pieces that did the vines. So collections, one-offs, where do you sit? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm always working on multiple paintings at a time. Like I can't, maybe I'd be more efficient if I just stuck with one and like worked all the way through, but I just don't, I found like I don't work that way. I like I might have too much paint on my palette and like want to add it to <laughs> a painting that I have around. You aren't the only one, trust me. <laughs> um, and, and I just, I like sometimes having paintings sit over to the side for a little while till I'm ready to work on them again. Sometimes they need, they need space to breathe. But that being said, like when I, sometimes I do, I'll have a show that I'm create a body of work for. Mm -hmm. But other than that, like I'm just working on three to five paintings at a time. All right. And then those get shed out to different galleries or if I'm preparing for a website release, then I might have you know, a handful of eight to 10 paintings for that. But I mean, I've never really thought about, could be, it would be interesting just to, to have like a, an idea, a collection of like women with bowls or <laughs> I don't know, like a collection of urns. I don't know. Yeah. Containers, container painting collection coming soon. Yeah. No. And it's, it's, it's just interesting. Cause you know, some people are like, no, I just do one offs. Some people are like, no, I have, I do collections. I'm one of those people that I paint in, in collections. Like I pick a theme cause I'm, I went to school for writing, creative writing. So it's just like all of my pieces have this underlying theme to them in a short story so that's why it's just always interesting to me to see what other artists do and i think like for me yeah. it's just like oh okay maybe i should try that that might be work a little bit better and you know have a little bit more you know um freedom you know a yeah. little bit i, I love that idea because it does give you structure um and sometimes that's helpful for creativity but and just um yeah, I'm just intuitive the way I do every everything. Yeah, you're so good. What's wrong with that? I think it's great. You know, that's part of, I guess, my process. But. Yeah. Um, so I, but I do like. Sorry to yeah. interrupt you, but I mean, like, there is a consistency. Like, it's always the same. Like, you know, figures and interior. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> the same, the same subject matter, but different themes get applied to them based on the elements that go in the painting. Yeah. <laughs> I got it. I got it. So I obviously our listeners who are just on the podcast side can't see it, but if you're, they're going to be watching on YouTube, they'll be able to see it. Can you describe the mood board behind you? I'm always interested when people have mood boards up oh. and like, like, yeah, well, some of them are, just pictures that I've found in magazines or printed out online. Um, it's a lot, there's a lot of figurative drawings that I've done. Um, some are drawings and paintings from my, my son when he was younger. He's 11. Or no, no, he's 10 now. He's about to be 11. Um, some of them are just quick, like playful color studies, um, shape studies. Some interior design photos that I love the color. This one is 
just take it off. Oh, there's one that's a painting mm -hmm. uh, that I did previously that I was printing it out and the printer like needed the, the color cartridge needed to be changed and it like did some crazy colors. And so I really liked how that came out. And so I put that up just to think about like reinventing that painting in a different way. Oh, that's cool. I love that. Yeah. But my favorites are like my, my son's little doodles. Yeah. And I've got like some art history references. Yeah. I see that up there. Um, oh, so it's just, I see something that inspires me. It goes up on the wall. I, I don't like actively reference it, but it's just, as I look there, it just brings me a lot of joy mm -hmm. and maybe it rubs off somehow. Yeah. No, I, I, when I'm painting, I do the same, like I'll print certain things off or sometimes like I'll have my Pinterest board, like my Pinterest board of color is more like interior spaces or other people's artworks or like color studies, um, from fashion, you know, and whenever I'm like needing inspiration, I'll go and just flip through my, my color board yeah. on my Pinterest to be like, Ooh, I like that color combo or I like that color combo, or, you know, I like that pattern. And it's like from some fashion week, you know, whatever. And they have the colors and the patterns and it's just, it's amazing how all of that crosses over in, into, yeah. into I love Pinterest. <laughs> it's so addicting. It's so addicting. <laughs> um, is there a particular painting that has like a fun story attached to it or was inspired by a unique story? Um, I mean, I've got a couple of different stories, but one, I think that it's not necessarily the story about, um, the actual painting part, but I had a painting that was stolen off a UPS truck. Why? Wow. A few years. Yeah. A few years ago. And never made it to its destination. I mean, this was a big painting, like not big, not huge, but like you, it's not, it was, would have not been hard. It would not have been easy to lose. Yeah. It, it, I guess that 30, 30 by 40 or you, hard to lose. like a big size that would needed. Yeah. Like 30, I think 36 by 36. Yeah. And, um, and so, yeah, it was in this big box, never made it, um, tracked it, like couldn't find lost package and so i had to go through like the whole process of like filing a claim and all that and um unfortunately like it just it never showed up like then like several years later i get a dm from somebody on instagram and says is this your work they had purchased that stolen painting off of like a platform i don't know like a second hand I'm not sure what the platform was, what? but like they probably sell like furniture and art and like motorcycles or whatever. And I'm like, yes, that is my painting. Where, where did you find it? They're like, that was stolen. And so they told, yeah. And so they told me, and he's basically wanting to get like a certificate of authenticity or something like that. And so um, I told him like the story of where it came, you know, that it, it was stolen off of truck. Um, You're like that painting actually belongs but... to someone else. <laughs> so did that person keep it or did? Yeah, oh. I, I mean, like they innocently bought it off of this whatever site. So I mean, I'm not been. It wasn't. It wasn't worth the the energy to like do anything about it. So oh man, it was just kind of interesting, like how that whole thing unfold unraveled and. Um, yeah, finally knowing where it landed up that or is, ended up. That's so, so. bizarre. Like for it, <laughs> actually that person to like actually reach out to you, not knowing anything. Yeah. And wow. That, I, <laughs> that's incredible. So, and I actually had another painting that was sold through a gallery th that I have here in Atlanta that never made it either. And it was also a large painting like 40 by 40 like if they never make it like where oh, i'm just my my mind the storyteller in me is like this is a really fun story like you know like a yeah. really interesting um so i don't put I, before i would put like rebecca jack art and all that on my package i don't do that anymore because of that interesting because i was just because i don't want anybody what, to know how would they have known 
that it was a painting, but that you because I had the yeah I had the stickers and stuff on it, and so it was identified as artwork. So yeah, I think somebody yeah saw that and was like, okay, <laughs> it got lost. Interesting. Yeah. Word to the wise, everyone: if you're shipping things, don't label it like that. Lesson learned. King Paul learned. <laughs> so I was, because you know, I was scouring your website as I do. Um, I love that all of your paintings and all the faces, they have names. I know you said they're not people, but like, how do you decide the names, like the, the titles of these paintings with these names? Do you just like keep a, a running list of like fun names to name them or... Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that's, it is a fun part of the process um, to name them afterwards. A lot of times I'll, I'll Google and run through some names and like look through, look at the painting and see like, is she a Cecilia or is she, you know, whatever the name <laughs> is like, and I also love naming them kind of weird on the weird side, <laughs> like you would maybe never name your child that name but it it's fun to name the paintings they can kind of take on that personality and then other times it might be that i've met i mean i might have a jillian come up soon like it might be somebody that i've interacted with um and that just you know ties into the painting that i've created so it's kind of both a little bit of both if you end up doing a painting and naming a jillian please let me know like i want <laughs> yeah, I don't think I've done a Jillian yet. Yeah. So. Um, so some of the other pieces like um, that you've done haven't actually had any figures in them. And I just, there's two that I really loved and they're in your archive. Like they're, they're sold um, and they're still lifes. And I love the ones that you have, like all the ingredients of the cocktail, like on a table. And so I liked the tennis and martini. And I love the old fashioned because when I love an old fashioned drink and when I saw, I love how like the vessels and the things and the bottles, they all overlap and they're just so unique. And I really love the tennis and martini one. I don't, there's, they were really fun to me. I was like, thank you. I mean, I'm not like one that plays tennis and drinks martinis, but I think it's just, I don't know, maybe it's an eighties reference, but it's just like a, a, a fun, I like being playful and whimsical and um yeah bringing two elements that are maybe unlikely yeah together i mean i can visualize like this uh country club in like florida with some you know people who are retired and like boca raton out there <laughs> playing tennis and drinking their martinis and at 11 <laughs> o'clock in the afternoon <laughs> Yeah, I probably should do a pickleball one now that it's trending. I know pickleball. That's just people. My parents, my parents are those people. They're like, it's pickleball Tuesday. <laughs> oh, I love that so much. Um, well, is is there anything else that you want to tell us about your your work, and maybe like where you're showing? Do you have any fun shows coming up? Like, where can people find you? Yeah. Well, uh, so you can find me on Instagram at Rebecca Jack artist um or my website r-e-b-j-a-c-k art.com um but i have a show coming up again at the high hampton in cashiers north carolina that's going to be in about three weeks i think no, uh, march 22nd of okay. 24th and so i'm going to be leading a workshop um for the afternoon that weekend and then have a special collection so that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I always love being up there in the mountains and, um, yeah, just having some time away from the studio. And then other than that, I've got a website release that I'm trying to pull together for the spring, like May, April, probably, it's probably going to be May the way things are looking right now, but that's like my next thing. And yeah, I'm just plugging away at, at work right now with commissions and like these deadlines and then hopefully gonna relax a little bit in the summertime before things ramp back up. Yeah. So you, that's awesome. And I'll try and um, make sure that all that information gets out before you have that. So if people are in 
um, North Carolina, um, they can see your work there or uh, make sure to alert them about your, your website release. So another thing, so you do do commissions. So if someone were wanted to do, do. a specialty piece, um, how do, how do you do commissions typically? Um, uh, well, so right now I have a, a wait list for the fall and, but I would say just reach out to me and I typically just ask for like sizing and colors and, um, maybe if there are some older pieces that you respond to mm -hmm. that I would use as inspiration. Mm -hmm. So I don't recreate old work, yeah. but I, I will take some, um, a few pieces that I've done before as like a direction to go from. Yeah. And then you, so then that's the other thing about like commissions that like, I think people always need to understand, like when you're asking an artist to do a commission, you are intuitively asking them to trust their creative process to, to like allow them to do what they do best without, you know, with a little bit of guidance, maybe color, maybe, you know, thing, but then you know, let, let the artist do the work, you know, and promise yeah. that they are going to make the best painting for you, you know, and just yeah. to trust the process. Yeah. It's commissions are a lot of pressure. I it's, um, it, it's been something that I've had to work hard to like relax about. And because for me, I've found that I need the most freedom and I need to not have somebody's, um, comments in my head. <laughs> Well, I'm painting uh, because it does affect the end result. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, I think that it's uh, it's something that has I've had to grow into and, and learn sometimes from mistakes or commissions in the past that, you know, if somebody's a little bit too um, specific, then it, it just really ruins the end result. Yeah, ruins the vibe of it all in the that whole creative process. At least for me, like maybe they were happy. <laughs> no, I totally. I to, I've done. Right. I've done a few commissions, and it's just like the more creative freedom that I got to have, and it was those were the best works. And then when someone was like, "Well, can you fix that one little spot?" and I was like, "That's like really part of the painting." So anyway, well, that's good to know. I'll make sure to include all of that information in the show notes and. Um, We'll get that all squared away. And thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Rebecca, for coming on the podcast today. It was wonderful talking to you. And I hope everyone listening enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. I hope I didn't ramble too much. Oh, no, no, it was perfect. Good to do that. It was perfect. <laughs> so, thanks. And that, my friends, wraps up another colorful episode of The Artist Stoop. A huge thank you to our incredible guests for sharing their art and stories. If you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss out on the next Stoop chat. And don't forget to spread the love. Share your favorite episodes with fellow art enthusiasts, and let's build this community together. Connect with us on social media at Jguze Studio and Jillian Zapata Art for behind the scene peeks, artist spotlights, and a sneak peek at my own art. Until next time, stay inspired, stay curious, and keep that creative fire burning. This is Jillian Zapata signing off from the Artist Stoop. And remember, the world is your canvas, so paint it vividly. Mm -hmm.